It's not simply a technology problem. You, you can't fix it without the appropriate technology. And we've invested, obviously, enormous sums building what I, I think is probably the first true healthcare network operating system. But the technology alone is not enough. At the end of the day, healthcare is about people helping people. Welcome to the Business of Healthcare podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management. The center is based at the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. The show, like the center, brings together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare industry. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, Director of the Master's Program in Healthcare Leadership and Management for Professionals. Today, we have Andrew Thorby, the CEO of Care Continuity, based in Dallas. Welcome to our studio on campus at UT Dallas today, Andrew. Thanks, Bob. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to visit with me. Well, I've known you for many years. Uh, you are the consummate entrepreneur for many decades. Uh, your history in healthcare is very long and lasting. And I think of you as a problem solver. And we have a very complicated and complex U.S. healthcare system. And you always seem to be looking at some of the big problems. And I know we could spend all day talking about various issues that we're confronted with today. But the thing that you're focused in here with care continuity, experts in care coordination. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, um, it's an interesting challenge, Bob. So I think one of the things that when we take a step back and look at the U.S. healthcare industry, one of the challenges we have um, quite frankly, is there's no good mechanism um, to convert better prices and better quality into market share. And fundamentally, you know, when we think about an individual patient, uh, the, the more uh, seriously ill or injured that patient is, the more complicated their journey. Um, and quite frankly, the more intimidating it is. And, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about um, – population health and and investing a great deal of money in clinical innovation. But at the core, our, our healthcare system to a large extent is driven by patient self-navigation, um, non-compliant facts, email, the rest of it. We, we, we talk about a system, but it's not really a system. And that's the challenge that, that we're addressing. In, in many ways, we laugh and we call ourselves, we're, we're plumbers of the healthcare system. We hook the pieces together. Um, you know, and as you and I have spoken on many occasions, uh, healthcare is driven by networks, these concept of networks. Hospitals have got them. Uh, accountable care organizations have got them. Payers have got them. Employers have got them. But underlying it, um, again, they're not operationalized. And, and that's what we've been working on that problem for shoot, the better part of 10 years now. So I understand that the elements that go into this solution process, passionate people, superior technology, and quality care. I know there's been a big shift and a big focus on quality. Tell us a little bit about how that's come about in the industry and why that's so important now. Well, I think fundamentally, um, one of the things as an industry we've recognized is that quality and cost effectiveness to a large extent are synonymous with one another. Um, and, and, and I think, um, as an industry, we're, we're recognizing that, um, the higher the quality of care that we deliver in many, many ways, it, it is the least, uh, expensive care. And so as an industry, um, now, by the way, just to be clear, I mean, I think all of us are both consumers, those of us that work in healthcare, and we have family members and, uh, and individually, we're all consumers of this industry. And, um, you know, we go back to this notion that, that all of us personally, just for, for our well-being, want to ensure that we ex experience a quality healthcare experience. Um, we don't want stuff falling through the cracks. We don't want mistakes to happen. And by the way, nor do the caregivers. Everybody's out there doing their best. Um, but I think, you know, the industry's made a lot of, a lot of strides over the last number of years in terms of pushing quality. But again, unfortunately, um, healthcare is somewhat unique in that it's perhaps the only industry where better quality, by and large, um, is not necessarily rewarded with increased market share. And so unfortunately, when we think about things like readmission risk, for example, you know, we've known for many, many, many years that if we ensure safe transitions, safe care transitions out of the acute care environment to high quality post-acute providers, we can minimize readmissions. But unfortunately, there wasn't a reason, a financial reason 
for healthcare organizations to, to really focus on the readmissions problem, uh, quite frankly, until CMS put in the readmission re the penalties. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we got penalized for it. But again, what we're finding is that we have to align uh, the financial incentives and the quality incentives. And, and that's one of the challenges that, as a whole, the industry is still grappling with, in my opinion. Okay, so when we start to, to look at it at a very high level of abstraction, a lot of problems out there in this healthcare system that's not a system. And when we start to come down a little bit lower on that ladder of abstraction and say, what is it you're really focused on? You, you mentioned networks, hospitals. Is that your sweet spot? Um, I would say yes at this point. We work with the large multi-site uh, hospital systems. And, you know, these are organizations that have invested enormous resources, um, employing physicians, building access points, imaging centers, labs, post-acute facilities. And um, I think, in fact, it was interesting, the J.P. Morgan conference in, in January, one of the, the prime uh, things that came out of that was um, it's the platform. It's the platform. And so we're very much focused on uh, helping these large healthcare organizations turn their delivery networks into platforms. It's, it's the network integrity challenge. Now, as you alluded to before, it's not simply a technology problem. You, you can't fix it without the appropriate technology. And we've invested, obviously, enormous sums building what I, I think is probably the first true healthcare network operating system. But the technology alone is not enough. At the end of the day, healthcare is about people helping people. And so to us, the technology allows us to help these large delivery organizations manage patient journeys across their ecosystems. And it allows us to do it efficiently, compliantly, transparently, and at scale. Um, and so that's primarily our focus right now is the hospital systems. But I will say uh, that we're starting to work with a number of ACOs. Um, you know, and again, it's fundamentally the same problem. Uh, and we're actually having some conversations with some of the larger employers as well. It is a different view of the same basic problem which gets back to this. Patients, seriously ill and or injured patients, do not have the tools, the equipment, the experience to successfully navigate um, what can be an incredibly complex ecosystem. So let's talk about that patient journey that you just mentioned. So give us an example of a real-world environment where what you do makes a huge difference for the patient and for the environment that they're in. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, I'll give you one of the early examples, and, and this is um, true. And to, to put it in context, I think we're navigating something like 25,000 patient journeys a month now. Um, you know, when we first started out, it was just a couple of hundred a month. And, you know, and I would say most of those those people um, are okay. But, for, you know, two, three, four, five percent of them, it makes all the difference. And I'll give you an example. I mean, early on, um, we had one of our emergency department attachment um, clients. And, you know, we have care concierges in the emergency department. And um, this was in a in a West Texas. So we won't go into the details of the system, but it was a an emergency department in West Texas. And we had a, a mom come in. Um, mother came, came into the ED with a daughter. Daughter was, I think, 17 years old. She had Crohn's disease. And the um, it was unmanaged. And they had moved to town recently. Um, she had uh, was experiencing, you know, the pain and, and symptoms. And so the ED physicians um, stabilized her, gave her some stuff for the pain, and recommended um, that that she see. I think it was a gastroenterologist to follow up. And there was only one of those physicians in um, El Paso at the time. Mm -hmm. It was El Paso, and, and it was a I think it was a seven seven week wait. And so. Uh, the mom, the, the physician handed the mom the, the discharge instructions and said, you know, give this, this physician a call. And she said, yeah, and she laughed. She said, yeah, good luck. We've, we've, we've been waiting for seven weeks to, to, to see him. And the care concierge basically said, well, let me take a shot at it. Went away and came back, you know, 15 minutes later with, uh, with an appointment slip for the next day. And, and she, you know, she literally right there burst into tears and she said, how did you do it? And the answer was, well, because it's what we do and, and we work with this practice all the time. And so you as a patient self-advocating, you can call. But on the other hand, that, that practice is extremely busy and they have no good way of determining what's a real emergency versus what's not. But when the, when the hospital, somebody representing the hospital calls and says, look, um, you know, from a clinical perspective, we really need to, to fit this patient in. Then, then most of the practices will, will do that. But again, it, it, it's simply the patient advocation role, if you will, I think is, is incredibly important. 
And again, you know, if it, if it's just to see a PCP or something like that, it's nice. Um, but where we see the real access problems is is when people get into the deep end of the pool. That's when they need the help. This episode is brought to you by the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, the definitive resource for healthcare management education in North Texas. The center is based in the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. It plays a unique role in training the next generation of healthcare leaders to meet local, regional, and national demands. The Jindal School uses its strengths in accounting, administration, finance, marketing, and information systems to educate highly qualified personnel for healthcare administration and executive leadership positions. The center is home to seven healthcare leadership and management programs, including undergraduate and graduate programs, as well as executive programs for physicians and working professionals. For more information, visit us online at jindal.utdallas.edu forward slash healthcare. So you've got a value proposition that probably resonates very well with hospital systems primarily? Um, yeah. So, so it's interesting. You know, I think all of us would recognize there's, there's probably no viable future state version of, of the U.S. healthcare system that doesn't involve what we would term fully coordinated care, at least across the, the deep end of the, of the pool and particularly for chronic care as well. Um, you know, that's why Mayo is so successful from a clinical perspective, but that model isn't, isn't realistic. Um, for everybody. But nonetheless, you know, when we think about a hospital and we think about where they are, um, by and large, most, it depends on where you are in the, in the country, quite frankly. I'm different. You know, we're moving to risk. I think as a, as an industry, we've recognized that we have to align the payment structure with the outcomes that we, we want. So say you can herd cats, you just move the food dish. And, and what we're trying to do here in healthcare is, is get everybody aligned. But the reality is, is these large systems are still stuck with one foot in the risk bed and one foot in the fee-for-service bed. And so you boat, if you will, and you, you have to have something that works for both because we don't want to be in a position where we're providing different levels of care to our patients based on how we get paid. Now, under fee-for-service, the the network integrity challenge issue, if you will, what we're trying to do is provide a better standard of care for those patients while they're in, at you know at the point of care, whether it's the emergency department or an inpatient or urgent care or whatever. Now, what that does in the short term, obviously, is we get better outcomes. So we're reducing ED returns by I would say twenty to twenty five percent in that zero to seven day time frame, and you know fifteen to up to eighteen percent over the zero the seven to thirty day time frame. But what we're also finding is that by doing a better job, then that hospital system is earning a larger share of the downstream spend. And so what you're doing under under fee-for-service, quite frankly, is earning more business in the future. And so what you find is if you coordinate care and do the right thing for the patient, offer a better level of service, even under fee-for-service, by and large, it makes sense. It makes economic sense, as in any other industry, right? I mean, you know, we provide better customer service. Uh, that's how we hang on to our customers, and healthcare is no different. Now, under risk-based contracting, um, it's obviously a much simpler equation. You you simply cannot accept financial or, or outcomes risk um, if you're not also coordinating care along that risk. It's it's uncovered risk and and you know again um, it's the network out migration problem. So you have ACOs with with that have spent a lot of money and a lot of time and effort assembling um, their narrow networks, the clinically integrated networks. And um, when patients inadvertently are forced out of those networks through access to care problems, um, nobody wins. So this plays very well into population health? I, th- I don't think you can do you, – well, to be perfectly honest, you, you can't successfully manage a population if you're not also doing the care logistics. Now, what we're interesting in, what, what, what's interesting is, is the ACOs that we're talking about. Uh, many of them have developed really sophisticated care management models, but these are nurse navigators that are principally running these, these navigation programs. And what you find is when you dig under the, in, into the details a little bit, um, they could be spending 50, 60, 70% of the time actually doing logistics. It's blocking and tackling. It's waiting on the phone to schedule an appointment or talk to a physician or, or what have you, making sure that physician A, um, has has access to the to the chart and the medical you know the the, the medication list from physician B. I mean it, it is it is just the care logistics. And so what we're finding is is it's making sense to put 
plumbers, care concierges, to handle the logistics and thereby leveraging those, uh, those nurse care management organizations. So. You hear a lot today about big data analytics and, you know, advanced technology, and you've made a lot of technology investments in what you're doing. Kind of share with us what your thoughts are, the future use of technology and what you're doing. It's not possible, um, as I said before, to address the challenges we face as an industry without the appropriate supporting technology. Now, I would say there there is a Think of it in this way. Think of the big data, and, and I think we've got some really, really good clinical ac- analytics packages out there that are doing the predictive analytics. And, and quite frankly, as we layer in AI, we're getting more and more actionable insights in, into, um, you know, kind of the care of the patients and best practices and what have you. The, the challenge then is you have to be able to turn insight into action. And to do insight into action is a workflow problem. And that's what we've focused on. We focus on workflow. Again, it's, it's plumbing. It's hooking the dot, connecting the dots across the care continuum. And so, for example, if you've got, you know, 100,000 managed lives and you've got clinical analytics, that package will be spitting out action items, if you will, workflow triggers. But you've got to then have a mechanism in place to then execute that at scale, at massive scale. Um, to do so compliantly, consistently, with no possibility of something falling through the cracks. You just can't manage this stuff without the technology. We think of it as, um, you know, in, in, in think of uh, the automobile industry or even better computers where you have ma- mass customization. That's our challenge as an industry. We have to figure out how to do that. Well, obviously, there's a lot of... Um great opportunity in front of you to solve problems. <laughs> and we look at the, we look at the industry at large going forward. Um, we see, you know, a lot of change, a lot of disruption taking place. And in the news, we hear about, you know, organizations like CVS and, and others, Aetna, mm-hmm. you know, trying to manage some of the um, chronic conditions at the pharmacy window. You look at some large employers like, like Amazon and Chase and Berkshire Hathaway trying to find ways to bring these efficiencies into their organization. You hear a lot of political noise now uh, about, you know, Medicare for all and different approaches along that line. Uh, the future outlook of this healthcare industry, which is is not a system at all, <laughs> where, where do you think we end up here in the future? Obviously, these things you're talking about, uh, the passionate people, the advanced technology, the quality focus, we all want that. And getting some of these inefficiencies driven out of the system allows us to have it at a cost point that makes sense. What's what's your hopeful outlook for the healthcare industry here in America? Well, <laughs> that's a that's a broad question, Bob. But but I think that that again, fundamentally, if we look at our OECD partners and, and taking a step back, I think we're headed we're at eighteen percent of GDP, headed to nineteen percent of GDP right now. We're not getting in an aggregate better outcomes, any better outcomes than than the Aussies, my home my home country, or the Germans. Uh, the Swiss or any of our OECD partners, really, and um, yet we're spending what six to seven percent more in GDP than they are. And and from an economic perspective, it's the equivalent of running a, a hundred yard race, but we've got the American economy starting at one hundred and nine yards. Now, the fact that we're still globally competitive is testimony to the fact that we are very, very good at at, at what we do as a, as an industry. But we have to figure out how to to get better results at lower cost. And I would say that most countries do have a public option. I think we're the only OECD, OECD nation that does not, in fact, have a public option. Um, now, whether we call it Medicare for all or whatever we call it, it doesn't matter. I think the Australians have taken an interesting approach. and They have a two-tier system, much the same way we do with education. So you've got the public option, um, which most people use for standard services, but you have the option to opt out and go private. Um, for certain conditions. And so, you know, the, the affluent people in society will, much like we have private schools, they, they go in that direction. I think basically, though, this doesn't get fixed until we reintroduce the market into healthcare. There has to be a mechanism when we have a health system that does, has better outcomes and lower costs. There has to be a mechanism to convert that into market share. It is the only sector of the economy outside of government where where that doesn't happen. And so in America, I would say, you know, we, we laugh about it and we say our system 
we, we are extraordinarily good at doing what we're incented to do. And we have almost, not deliberately, but we have created a system that rewards systemic inefficiency. And, and boy, we have knocked it out of the park. We have, we have the most efficiently inefficient system that's out there. We're, we're brilliant at it. And, and we have some of the brightest minds in the entire country working in healthcare. If we can reestablish market dynamics. So if we break up this, to, the way I look at it is, is we need to separate the components. So, so on one hand, we have the societal obligation to provide care to our population. And nobody wants to see people dying in the streets or what have you. And you shouldn't be withholding needed emergency care or care for children or whatever because of economics. We shouldn't do that. Um, but at the same token, if we could make the industry more efficient and if we, we rewarded innovation and efficiency, then that drops our total delivery cost, which then in turn reduces the societal cost of providing care to those that can't afford to pay it for themselves. So I, I, I like to tease these into two separate subjects. The, how do we make the industry more effective? Question number one. And question number two, how then do we provide needed care to those people that quite simply can't afford it? Right. Um, because I think as a society, we, we do have that second obligation. But at the same token, confusing the two makes it hard to, hard to fix either one. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. We're going to point, point our audience to uh, a LinkedIn posting that you wrote about the safety net in America oh. <laughs> being at risk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's an interesting one. It well, is. It is. You know, we, we, when you look at the, the two components that you just broke out, you know, there's certainly a, a concern for those that do need the care, that can't afford the care, and how do we fund that and manage that. And another big area, and we'll kind of close up with this, is your thoughts on transparency on pricing. Oh, I think transparency on pricing is essential. I mean, I absolutely believe that transparency on, on pricing is essential. But I also want to touch base to what you were talking about on the safety net there. So, so to be clear, um, EMTALA, which is the legislation that requires um, patients get treated when they show up in the emergency room regardless of their ability to pay, EMTALA was, was – Obviously well-intentioned, um, but it is the largest unfunded mandate in galactic history. And the problem is that that burden of providing care to those people in the population that can't afford it, you know, and you've got states where you've expanded Medicaid and it's not so bad, and then other states like Texas where we've uh, elected not to, and a mistake in my opinion, but that's above my pay grade. But regardless... I, I think we have to recognize that hospitals that have emergency departments attached to them, they're, they're carrying the load. They're carrying the load. And, and in a system, we'll always try to find the most efficient way to do something. And so when we have ambulatory surgery centers that, that don't have the EMTALA mandate and are able to offer the higher dollar surgical procedures at a much lower cost, we've broken the market. We've absolutely broken the market. So if we had price transparency, we'd say, okay, I can get this done at, you know, a, a knee replacement done at XYZ acute care facility with an emergency department. Now, by the way, if I'm at risk, then I probably should do that because I've also got an ICU. But conversely, if I'm relatively healthy, I can get it done at half the cost in an ambulatory surgery center. Why? Well, because the ambulatory surgery center doesn't have to pay the cost of providing care to the population that's not, not insured. We have to address that fundamental problem at the core. So yes, price transparency is absolutely critical, as is transparency on quality. But we have to recognize that we have placed this unfunded burden on a section of the, of the, of the industry. And until we fix that, this doesn't get fixed either. Yeah. So we have another opportunity to have you back a dozen more times. We can go on and on and on about some of these issues, but <laughs> it's been a real, real treat for our audience to kind of get your perspective and what you're doing with care continuity and really driving into this healthcare system some more real system capabilities. So, yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's, yeah, it's, it's good to have you here. So Andrew Thorby with um, Care Continuity. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Business of Healthcare podcast. Join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com to find episode links, notes, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Business of Healthcare podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. 
To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jundle.utdallas.edu and then search under the Center and Institutes tab on the navigation menu. Also, we want to hear from you. If you'd like to provide feedback, make suggestions for future guests or show topics, or just want to get in touch with us, email us at healthcarebizpodcast at utdallas.edu. Biz is spelled B-I-Z. And let us know how we're doing. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Kaiser, with the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, where we're leading change by changing how we lead.